Hi, welcome to part two of Live Security's malware analysis video on rootkits. In part one, we configured and ran Hacker Defender, a rootkit. In this part, I'll explain an important sneak technique rootkits use to control your computer. Then we'll see how this technique applies to an advanced feature of Hacker Defender. A rootkit subverts your data and corrupts your operating system, but hides these activities from you. How? That's like asking where do crooks get money, because there's so many possible answers. But one important technique that almost all rootkits use is called hooking. Hacker Defender uses a version of hooking called inline function hooking. What's that? Watch the magic whiteboard. When a program runs, typically it needs to invoke subroutines called functions. For example, you might have a program that lists every hospital in a county or province. If you wanted a list displayed in alphabetical order, the program might call an alphabetizing function to handle that part of the query. The function does its thing, then returns the results to the program. Note that the function always returns its results to whatever program made the request. At least that's how it should work. Now let's add a rootkit. And let's say that in this example, the function code provides a list of what files are in a directory. At some point, the program needs a directory listing, so it calls the function. However, the rootkit has taken the first five bytes of the function code and moved them to a memory location the attacker chose, replacing those bytes with a jump instruction. When the program's request hits the start of the function, the jump makes it go to the memory location of the rootkit's detour function. The rootkit code now runs the original function. However, because part of the original code has been moved, right now the function can't function. So the rootkit calls that first bit of code, referred to as the trampoline, which allows the function to resume as it normally would after the jump point. This little swap fools the function into believing that the rootkit code is the origin of the request. So when the function is done, it returns its results to the rootkit. The rootkit code can then decide which parts of the results to pass to the real program. In this example, we said the function lists files in a directory. If the directory listing happens to include files put there by the rootkit, the rootkit simply does not pass those file names to the application. That's one way the rootkit hides from a user. And since this all happens in nanoseconds, the user never suspects the rootkit's even there. This is just one example of how a rootkit can exploit inline function hooking. This one technique can be applied in about a jillion malicious ways. In fact, it powers one of Hacker Defender's most devious features. I'll show you that next. What an attacker does with inline function hooking depends upon which function he's hooking. For example, Hacker Defender hooks all of these functions found within the Windows default dynamic link libraries. Windows uses certain functions to receive network connections. By hooking those functions alone, Hacker Defender can cause a ton of trouble. I'll show you. For this example, suppose that I, as the attacker, have loaded Hacker Defender on a victim computer that runs a web server. That means the HTTP port is open to the world. So when a remote computer requests a connection on port 80, you would see something like this. This shows the web server behaving normally. But since Hacker Defender is present, watch what happens when an attacker connects to port 80. Presto, a remote command shell. By the way, while I have a shell up, note that the remote attacker can see his own files on the victim computer. These same processes are not visible from the victim's machine. I specified this in Hacker Defender's root processes configuration, shown in part one of this video. How did I get shell on port 80 when anyone else gets normal web traffic? 
Hacker Defender contains a backdoor that installs on its victim by default. And Hacker Defender provides a special client program run from the attack machine made specifically to connect to that backdoor. It is activated when someone connects using a packet containing the magic bullet. In part one, I pointed out a Hacker Defender file called bdcli100.exe. Executing that causes a 256-bit key plus a password to be sent. When Hacker Defender receives the key, it opens the back door. Here's the scary part. Most back doors require connecting to a specific port. But Hacker Defender is hooking the functions that control all incoming TCP connections. That means the attacker can activate his back door if the victim machine is listening on any port whatsoever. Even worse, since the attacker is leveraging ports the victim has opened, his backdoor connection will probably pass right through a firewall. Let's recap. With inline function hooking, an attacker can intercept and subvert almost any function Windows calls. He can connect to your computer on any listening port, and he can hide his activities from all the usual ways of seeing what your PC is doing. What could be worse? Well, actually, lots of things. Hacker Defender is an example of a user-level rootkit. I haven't discussed kernel-level rootkits, which are even more devious and powerful. I haven't covered other types of hooking. There's plenty more to say about rootkits, but at least now you have a basic introduction to them. By now you might be wondering how you can defend yourself against rootkits. We've detailed that for you in articles you can find online in Live Security's broadcast archive. This is a subscribers only site, but you can get a free 30-day trial by visiting the URL showing on your screen. Once you're in, just search the archives for the word rootkits. This trial comes with no costs or obligation. Need to understand more about the latest attacks? With live security, problem solved. See you next time. This is the coolest thing I have ever seen.